The second major future creature to enter the series, the Mer are large marine primates from long after humanity's extinction. Featuring as the primary creatures in an episode of the second series, we see the Mer exhibit huge sexual dimorphism, with the massive females being far outnumbered by the small males. We also get a brief glimpse of their home conditions too, so let's use a mix of pinniped and primate biology to try and build some theories on the Mer. Perhaps the first question anyone may have would be the how and the why of primates becoming marine animals to start with, but there's maybe some reasonable precedent here. Over half of primate species today live in permanently or seasonally flooded habitats, be they inland freshwater wetlands or saltwater tidal zones. And this isn't a new association. Primates have evolved and dwelled in such habitats for millennia. So whilst primates may not be necessarily adapted for swimming, there is already at least some groundwork for them to be exploiting aquatic environments for resources. Of the assorted wetland environments, coasts do seem to be the most logical choice for an animal to become a marine species in. And primates are well represented here. Savannah monkeys and some species of macaque are in thriving populations in such areas, and Chakma baboon troops frequent coastal areas of the Western Cape in South Africa. So with the potential primates in place, what evolutionary pushes could occur to drive them into the sea? Maybe a clue here lies in the glimpse we get of the Mer's home time period. The appearance looks incredibly dry, with a barren desert landscape showing limited signs of vegetation inland. The explanation seems to be a significant period of either global or localised aridity in the range of some of the coastal primates that likely forced them into the sea over millennia. And some of the very early terrestrial whale ancestors may well have taken to aquatic, if not necessarily marine, habitats due to an arid climate. The disappearance or extreme reduction of coastal forests and vegetation could have major effects other than just food. For one, it reduces refugia, so when accosted by land-based predators, the Mer ancestors would have no choice but to flee into the water. This has been suggested as a possible behaviour of the ancient whale ancestor Indohyus, that may have had mouse-deer-like behaviours of taking to and hiding in the water. It's also a behaviour we see in some modern primates like proboscis monkeys, that will dive into rivers when threatened by land-based predators. It also means that there's a little shade, so if increased temperatures accompanied the arid climate, taking to the ocean may well have been the only way for them to keep cool as well. Early Mer ancestors may have been visually similar to modern primates, but with more subtle anatomical differences. Some early whale ancestors were terrestrial animals, but with dense long bones like hippos, that may well have helped with aquatic life. As forests began to diminish, Primates may well have swapped great mobility in the trees for better buoyancy control in the water, while still remaining as chiefly primate in appearance. It's been suggested that the leap from terrestrial to aquatic also happened quite quickly in evolutionary terms, so these adaptations may have also allowed Mer ancestors to make the leap in a period of climate crisis, or just to exploit untapped niches. In terms of resources though, some primates are already reasonably well versed in exploiting marine environments for food, and some populations get good chunks of their nutrients from shoreline resources. However, these populations of coastal primates do seem to still face limitations in fully embracing the sea for their primary source of food. Chakma baboons around Cape Town don't seem to fully utilise the ocean as much as expected, Despite the availability of quality nutrients, it's suggested that the tide obviously presents a notable factor. No one wants to get washed out to sea after all, and so this only gives the baboons a time-limited window with which to feed. Again, increased density of the limbs and long bones would help past Mer ancestors to anchor themselves to rocks like marine iguanas, preventing them being washed out to sea and allowing much longer foraging periods in tidal zones. It's also suggested that seafood may be rich in certain substances the baboons aren't overly fond of, that may limit how much they can effectively utilise this resource at present. 
Similarly, studies of Japanese macaques show that seaweed and algae, at least, is generally considered inferior forage to fruits and other plant matter from inland forests. And whilst coastal habitats may be livable, they may not necessarily be prime primate real estate. But studies do suggest that seafood is a reliable food source, with little seasonal variation unlike that of forest resources, and that macaques may be driven to the shorelines to forage in lean periods, again suggesting something like the murk could arise from primates being given no other choice but to get their food from the sea. Although some species of primates do already seem to get the majority of their food from the sea, one population of savannah monkeys is described as primarily living off fiddler crabs. The chakma baboons are described as mainly eating mollusks like mussels and limpids, with only occasional other foodstuffs like crabs or shark eggs. So it could be that something of a dietary switch is needed for the mer ancestor to fully progress to a seafood diet, and then a marine lifestyle. One perhaps of mainly crustaceans and other marine life like savannah monkeys, over the seaweed and mollusks most other coastal primates seem to be utilising right now. Alternatively, mutations that allow for such primates to better digest and utilise resources like mollusks or seaweed could arise, and with increasing inland aridity, this would likely become more and more selected for. This could then be the stepping stone between modern primates and early aquatic mer ancestors, resembling something of a monkey otter. With all this talk of mer ancestors, I do feel the mer are derived monkeys rather than derived apes, despite the gorilla-like appearance of the mer queen. And despite this and the prevalence of both New World monkeys and great apes in flooded habitats, I'd suggest them to be almost certainly very derived Sarcopithecidae, which is to say Old World monkeys. The male mer do have somewhat baboon-like skulls, and the three main examples of coastal primates given here of savannah monkeys, Japanese macaques, and chakma baboons all seem like the most likely candidates for the ancient base species. But once they'd become the mer we see in the series, what may their ecology be like? And are they really that pinniped-like? One way to look into this could be the way that they swim. And with their still somewhat primate-like arms that can't really be described as flippers yet, it seems very likely that mer swim like most fossid seals, also being known as true or earless seals, using undulations of the body and the hind flippers, with the fore flippers being used to steer mainly. This is an effective way to swim, but doesn't allow for the rapid turns and bursts of speed that the Atarid method does. They can attain considerable underwater mobility by flapping with the foreflippers. This is also seen in the fossid leopard seals, and may well be correlated with pursuit predation on reasonably fast prey, be it fish or penguins. Pinnipeds in general show considerable diversity in their diet and methods of prey capture, but fossils generally aren't built to utilise speed and agility as much in their own feeding and are often successful divers that can forage along the sea floor. The hand-like flippers of the mer may actually come into play here as well. Fossids have pretty incredible vibrissae, or whiskers, that are unbelievably sensitive. One experiment showed that they were able to successfully follow the path of a controlled mini-submarine, with no visual stimuli and for considerable time after the submarine itself had stopped, just by following the remaining minute movements in the water. The mer don't seem to have equivalent whiskers that are so important for foraging, but they do have their very dexterous and presumably very sensitive hand flippers. So with their comparatively slower swim speeds but also lesser abilities to detect prey underwater, the mer may be something of a benthic specialist, diving to the sea floors to forage for comparatively sessile prey on the sea floor, like mollusks, crustaceans, cephalopods and flatfish. One advantage the mer may have over pinnipeds is that they may have retained colour vision. Most primates like us have reasonable colour vision for mammal standards, but this isn't shared by the carnivora. Being able to see colour on the sea floor may help the mer detect camouflaged animals that they'd otherwise miss, that other marine animals would pick up with their refined senses. This may provide some limitations though and mer may be only diurnal like their terrestrial ancestors. Pinnipeds can forage around the clock, 
but a dependence on sight may comparatively restrict myrrh to daytime feeding only. We also know that the myrrh share their waters with large future sharks, like the one killed by Stephen in the Thames after it went after Claudia Brat Jenny Lewis. Sharks are adept at hunting in low-light conditions, especially for pinnipeds, and an already stacked deck against them may make low-light foraging untenably dangerous for the myrrh, as well as just less successful. Another reason myrrh, at least at this point, may keep their forelimbs as arm-like, could be for terrestrial locomotion. Elephant seals are the largest pinnipeds, and on land the movements of large bulls are very energetically costly, both in comparison to their smaller cousins, but also other large mammals when on land. The myrrh queen is significantly larger than even the largest bull elephant seal, approaching the size of a large cetacean. As such, they may require a torso still resembling those more closely of a terrestrial mammal, and accompanying limb morphology as well, so that they can still support themselves and move on land. The more typical pinniped movement may be energetically or physically untenable at such a size as the Mer Queen's reach. Speaking of the Mer Queen, why do the Mer have some of the most extreme sexual dimorphism of any vertebrate? This may be for several reasons, but perhaps one of the most prevalent could be the Big Mother hypothesis, which is effectively that Big Mothers are better ones. They handle pregnancy better, have larger, healthier offspring, and produce more milk for their young. In the case of the myr, considering the size difference between the two sexes, it seems so extreme it's hard to imagine the male myr having much of a pup stage. They could effectively be born at full size, or close enough to it. And this may actually fit in with the myr taking on another strategy seen in some pinnipeds, of a very short nursing period. In some seals, it can be as short as a few weeks or even a few days, where the mother suckles her pup for a very short period of time before she stops producing milk and the pup has to last on its reserves before it starts foraging for itself. The Mer Queen may be able to rapidly produce almost full-sized pups that require very little care before being booted out, and so may be able to achieve very high fecundity to make up for the seemingly very uneven sex ratios. All the Mer we see in the future but the Queen do seem to be males, and whilst this could be an elephant seal-like situation where there are other females, and they just don't get to breed until the dominant one is out of the way, or they may just be out foraging, this still does seem like a very uneven ratio. This does also leave the question of what do Mer queens do when they give birth to another female, whether these are nursed for longer periods and given some additional care, or if juvenile Mer queens are near identical to males until they're fully matured. Explaining larger female body size is already tough enough with fictitious animals, but it could also be that it's a two-way street, and that male mer have some selective pressures to be smaller. It's hard to imagine what this could be, as marine mammals generally do better at larger body sizes, and the males would still presumably compete for the rare females. Another contributing factor may be how the differences in size could affect the foraging strategies of the two sexes of myr. Northern elephant seals have a similar, but not quite as huge, sexual dimorphism as the myr, albeit with the males being significantly larger than the females. This in turn results in significant differences in their feeding ecology and habitat use. The males use continental shelf habitats at relatively shallow depth, and do very well in these productive habitats. They can attain significantly more mass than the females, and gain energy just over four times faster than them too. In contrast, the smaller females have a much longer commute and to a less productive area, and dive to greater depths in offshore open water environments with patchier, less reliable resources. The trade-off in this comes that the males are also six times more likely to die, with predation being suggested as the most likely cause. Males take this huge risk because for the boys it really is all about those gains. The largest elephant seals have the best chance of mating, and so have to take the chance of predator attack to become and stay the beach master. So maybe the myrrh are quite similar, but for the females they become hugely sexually dimorphic to repel predators. The initial drive for adequate nutrients for reproduction could have led to some females taking the risk of foraging in coastal habitats, 
with the largest females surviving. In contrast, the males are happy to forage in the more risk-free environments, and so never had this selective pressure. Predator repellent is one of the drivers of large male size in actual primates, among others, and so to some extent this does then match up with the size of the merqueens. We see one such potential predator, the future shark with the chameleon-like tongue. This is a large shark, easily large enough to take a leopard seal-sized male mer. But against the huge and robust merqueens, it would probably be better off looking for another meal. Almost like with gorillas partially abandoning trees due to their large size, considering there are some selective pressures too for marine mammals to become larger, once the merqueen reaches a certain size, it may get nothing but benefits from it. In heat retention, in repelling other females, and also predators too, until it reaches the level of sexual dimorphism that we see in the series. It may also allow the merqueen to exploit significantly different sources of food to the males as well. Whilst leopard seals are known as significant predators of the southern waters, and fur seals will occasionally go for penguins too, a lesser known macro predator among the seals is the grey seal, which is now known to be a frequent and significant natural predator of harbour porpoises. Little is known of the marine ecosystems of the far future, and which cetaceans even make it past the 21st century. But it could well be possible that merqueens are occasional predators of other large marine vertebrates, including cetaceans or cetacean analog animals too. For my thoughts on the mer, I think they're a quite a solid representation of the aquatic ape theory. Amphibious primates have always been bandied about, from the not especially well thought out suggestions of humans having an aquatic origin, to their prevalence in Spec Evo being tied with the killer ape theory for some of the most recognisable tropes, as well as possibly being a reference to Kurt Vonnegut's Galapagos, which features an almost civilised version of the mer. I do also like the early concept art, which shows them as much more walrus and mandrill than like a seal, but I'm happy with the final design we got of the pinniped-like body with primate arms and a baboon-like head. It's not impossible to imagine the walrus mer as just a larger species from northern latitudes as well. They had a pretty solid episode in series 2, and then after making another appearance in the finale, they then dipped from the series. A bit of a shame, but then it's easy to see why, in that the future series were more packed with other creatures. I still feel that series 1 of Primeval was the best. There's something about the much more ad hoc nature that really suited Primeval, rather than them being an organised team with the arc. But series 2 did deliver on raising the stakes and delivering more and bigger creatures too. And then things just definitely tail off a bit in season 3 with Cutters leaving. Thanks for watching. And thanks as ever to all of my patrons, but especially Erengar Steiny for their donations. I really do appreciate it. If this is my first video that you've seen and you've made it this far, and maybe even wanted more, then I also covered the future Predator a short while ago so be sure to check that out. I also have some other Spec Evo stuff like Peter Jackson's Skull Island if you're curious, and plenty of Monster Hunter content with more to come. If you like what you see, please do consider subscribing and sharing with others. In a way, the Mer were really far more difficult to come up with solid theories for, what with the enormous Mer Queen versus the tiny males. So let me know what you think, and what your own theories are. Especially if there's any good thoughts on what selective pressures there could be for smaller males. For some extra info regarding the future Predator 2, one of its creators from Impossible Pictures wrote to me telling me about the Walking With Era and Primeval. Something said that when they were initially told to conceive the future Predator, they weren't told it was a ground bat, and the design teams only found this out later, hence some of the more early reptilian concept art. The limbs especially were changed with this news, and its gait was deliberate in being bat-like with its hops. Obvious bat-like anatomical features weren't included, so as not to make it too obvious, nor too much like other Hollywood giant bat monsters that were seen at the time. The dome-like forehead was also meant to be reminiscent of cetaceans like beluga whales and dolphins too. They also mentioned how, at the time of Walking with Dinosaurs, that Impossible Pictures was partly named by Tim Haynes, in reference to the difficulty of the task they had going ahead. Outside of Hollywood's Industrial Light and Magic, 
It's really worth noting how CGI was very raw and new at the time. No one had huge amounts of experience with it, and barely any non-Hollywood studios really used it. In comparison with today, with both the hypersaturation of CGI in visual media, plus the enormous amounts of courses, tutorials, and manuals, the team really were flying blind in comparison, and being a small team, they really had to think on their feet. It's no wonder Impossible Pictures became such a significant company in the 2000s, and in my opinion, this only makes the Walking With series that extra bit more impressive for its era as well. These are just a few tidbits from a nice email sent to me that I thought some other people may also enjoy to learn about as well. For the next video, we'll be back to Monster Hunter, and it'll be a surprise because I haven't quite decided who it'll be yet.